Hey, it's Brandon. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Swanson Health is the only company to offer the full spectrum of wellness products for mind, body, and home. From quality vitamins and supplements to cruelty-free beauty items to eco-friendly home products, Swanson Health is here to keep you healthy. Swanson Health only supports products they're proud to use and give to their own families, backing everything by strict quality standards with the Swanson Quality Code. Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. And in fact, I got a chance to use several of the products from ones that I've already used like Burt's Bees hand cream to new ones like the probiotics by Swanson Health. And I was so happy to use those products and they're, and they're great. So pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. That's code WORK20 for 20% off on Swanson.com. Now on to the show. Hey, it's Brandon, and welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. Today's episode is such a great one. I had a conversation with Peter Economy. He is Inc.'s leadership guy, and he wrote a book called Wait, I'm the Boss, The Essential Guide for New Managers to Succeed from Day One. And I really, really enjoyed this book. After I read it, I I told Peter when we had the conversation that I'm like, wow, you know, if I, as a new manager, I wish I would have had something like this that would have really outlined everything that I should be doing. So we touched on so many areas of management, like, you know, moving from contributor to, to manager and, you know, how that responsibility changes. And, and we just cover all aspects of management and, uh, anybody who is either new to management needs to brush up on their management skills or, you know, if you're a leader in an organization or an HR person who's like, I need to provide my people with tools, this is the episode for you. And I encourage you to go check out the book. Very easy to read, 180 pages or something like that. So um, I think you'll find it to be very helpful. Enjoy the interview with Peter. Um, he's He was great, uh, very articulate, very enjoyable to talk to. And um, anyways, have a great week and we'll talk to you next week. Next week is episode number 250, by the way. And I've got a really, really awesome episode that I've been kind of saving up and waiting for episode number 250. So enjoy and I will talk to you next week. Hey, Peter, it is great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Great to be here, Brandon. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So you wrote a book and it's a great book. I wish I had this as a new manager. It's called Wait, I'm the Boss, The Essential Guide for New Managers to Succeed from Day One. This is a great book. Why did you decide to write this? Well, I've been writing books for quite a while. And long ago, I was a manager myself. And I think one of the big things I've noticed is that most managers don't get training at all. Most new managers, well, new and existing managers, they just don't get training. But I think it's most critical for new managers. I know years ago when I was first tapped to become a manager, I had zero experience. I mean, the only experience I had with management was watching my boss do it. And that's fine if you've got a good boss. But if you've got a bad boss, and there are a lot of bad bosses out there, uh, that can be a real problem. In fact, you know, Gallup's done surveys, you know, Gallup's does surveys on everything, but they've also done surveys on the workplace. And the number one reason they've found that people quit their jobs is because of a bad boss. So my goal with writing this book was to get the techniques that any new boss needs to have and get them in their hands so they could be a great boss. I think you had a stat in the book somewhere early on where it was like new managers or I guess managers in general don't receive training until like the age of 42 or something like that. I I might be butchering the number, but I was shocked by that. It probably depends on when people become managers, but I thought that's pretty telling. New managers probably don't receive training for several years until it's probably too late. 
Yeah. I mean, by the time you get some training, and you're right, I mean, it is quite late in life. And a lot of people are thrown into management roles without any training at all. There's another statistic in the book, and I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's about 12 minutes per year that businesses up to, I think, 500 employees or so give their managers each year, just 12 minutes. And then I think for bigger businesses, it might be 24 minutes, something like that. But I mean, it's just basically hardly any training is happening. It's not happening anytime early in a person's career. So bad news all around. Yeah. And you mentioned something that would just really stuck with me. You wrote that, you know, practicing without proper training can lead to really, really bad habits. And I'm a huge baseball fan, right? So imagine me playing and never having any practice about what a real good swing is. But yet I just practiced over and over the worst swing. Imagine what this is going to translate to long term. So you tailor that to a manager, they practice behaviors or management practices that aren't good. What does that do long term? Yeah, you're exactly right. You create these habits that so hard to break. It takes days and weeks and months to break a bad habit. I mean, there's been plenty of research about that. And once you've got a habit ingrained, and it's so true, you're like you're talking about in baseball with a swing or golf with their swings. Oh, yeah. All these kinds of sports where you've got, it's all repetition. I used to be a big tennis player. And to get my serves consistent, that just was practice and practice, and you get this groove. And then hopefully you carry it forward. It's just automatic. Well, that's true with the manager too. You know, once you've learned these skills, if you've learned bad habits, they're going to stay with you for almost forever. And there's got to be some motivation, some pretty strong motivation to get you to change those bad habits. Most managers don't even bother trying to change them unless they're under extreme pressure, maybe getting fired or something because the employees are complaining so much. But otherwise, you'll just carry those bad habits forward. So I guess the lesson from that is train managers properly early on, right? Definitely. That's the key. And preferably when they become a manager the first time. I think when I became a manager the first time, I was probably in my mid-20s, something like that, mid to upper 20s. So that's when I should have received my management training. Never did. Again, the only training I received was watching my boss. Unfortunately, I had a good boss, so that helped. What's really fascinating to me and is probably why you wrote this book in the first place was that when people are really good contributors and then they get moved up to a management role, is there any training happening before they become a manager? Because it seems like it'd be really appropriate to say, okay, here's my high potential people that are probably within the next year, I'm going to move into a management position. Let's start them on some sort of training program now. Does that ever happen? It does. and But it typically only happens in the largest organizations. So say Fortune 500 companies, I can guarantee you that Ford Motor Company or Procter & Gamble or Microsoft, I bet you I can be guaranteeing to you that those companies have full-on management tracks with full-on, you know, they identify the candidates who they think will be great managers as they go up their career progression. They have all sorts of training for those people. They'll send them around the world to different offices around the world with progressively greater responsibility for larger and larger groups of people and, and larger budgets and things. So, The largest companies definitely have that training and they do tap people and they identify them early on and then give them the training they need. But it's a small and medium sized businesses that often don't have that at all. I mean, imagine the mom and pop down the street that there's just maybe 10 people or something. It's unlikely they have any sort of training at all. 500 person organization. As I said, the research shows that they they may give their managers 12 minutes of training a year. So generally, that's where they falls apart. and But you're right. You're perfectly right that that's exactly when you should get the training is when you're starting out as a manager. Let's talk about the different schools of thought behind management. So you, you talk about theory X management and theory Y management. I actually hadn't really heard of these, but when I was reading about them, it makes a lot of sense that people fall into one of these two camps. Talk about those are the differences in where people should really lean. Sure. This is a theory, and I think it came out of the 60s. A guy named Douglas McGregor, I think he was a professor at some university somewhere, management professor. And his idea, Theory X, was that this is a perspective, this is a mindset that managers have, that their employees are lazy, they're trying to cheat the system, they don't want to really work, they'd rather be home. Us against them sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. So Theory X is the mindset of a manager that says that the employees are kind of bad. 
That's the basic assumption. Theory Y, on the other hand, is a mindset for managers that says, actually, employees are good. They want to do a good job. They don't come to work wanting to do a bad job. They come to work wanting to do a good job. They're not going to try to cheat the system. You can trust them. You can give them your trust and you can assume that they're going to want to do the right thing. So that's theory Y. And I think that there's sort of a balance that has to be achieved. There's good and bad in each of those theories. So I think that a good manager will look at both and make sure that you trust your people, make sure that you believe that they're good, inherently good, and they want to do good. But then you've still got to hold people accountable. You can't just assume they're going to do everything that you ask them to do. They're, they're going to achieve every goal that you set. Uh, you need to set standards. You need to have performance reviews. You need to have goals that they can achieve and hold them accountable to those goals. So it's a little bit of theory X mixed in with a lot of theory Y, I think. You mentioned goals. And I always felt like as a new manager, setting specific and relevant goals that you can measure for your employees was always like one of the hardest things to do, especially just being new. What are some ways that you like to go about goal setting and make it an involved kind of partnership minded process? Yeah. You know, goals are really what make the world go round as far as business, because you got to have goals, you got to have plans for the future, you've got to have goals. And goals are what tell your people what they should be doing. It provides them the motivation to focus on a specific task and then actually get it done. So definitely goals have to be collaborative. It's something that you need to do with your people, not at your people or for your people. It's something you do with your people. You set the goals together and make sure that that they're appropriate for the job that needs to be done. So I would say it's a very interactive process. I had worked with a guy named Adam Creek. He's an Olympian, Canadian Olympic rower from the 2008 Olympics. They got the gold medal in rowing in 2008. And there's been these things called SMART goals for a million years. I think everybody's heard about them. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And that's been great. Those have been around for 30, 40 years, I think. But Adam came up with a new set of goals that really is more relevant to organizations today. He calls that clear goals, which are collaborative, which again, we've been talking about collaborative. They're limited in duration. They're emotional. They actually appeal to people's passion, to their, what they want to do, you know, their purpose in life and purpose at work. They're appreciable, so they're not big, huge goals. They're like small, little goals that you can get momentum behind and then add up into bigger accomplishments. And they're refinable, meaning that you're agile, that you can shift them around in an agile way when the environment changes in which you're doing business. What's a way that you really like to measure goals and how many checkpoints should managers have with their people regarding goals? Yeah, it's interesting. I do a lot of work now with tech people with, like I just said, Agile, but these people, they're product development people. They're developing, you go to Amazon, you look at the page, that's a product for Amazon, their actual page. And they're, they're always tweaking their pages and things and creating these new parts to their websites and things. But they're really big in these short cycles. So a two-week cycle, for example, of you try something, you try it for a couple of weeks, and then you assess the result. And then you, from those results, you've learned something and you apply that learning to another round of essentially going forward. I think that goals should be something that you do. They should be quantified as often as possible. Um, so instead of saying, I want you to increase your sales this quarter, it should be increased sales by 15% this quarter. There should always be a quantifiable element to it. It should always be a number. It should be measurable. It has to be measurable. And I think the more often that you can set these goals, so instead of them being a year long, so you'll increase your sales by 15% this year. I think that's way too long. And probably a quarter is too long too. And maybe even a month is too long. Weekly wouldn't be too often, I don't think, to set a goal. You'll increase your sales by half a percent this week kind of thing. But it depends on the situation and it depends on the employees and it depends on the goals themselves. But I would say more often is better and always quantifiable. The business environment is changing rapidly. And I say with it seems like the last five years have just drastically changed. This, a lot of it's due to technology. The needs of people are probably changing quite a bit. And you mentioned that developing a learning organization can really help 
organizations adapt to the rapidly changing environment. And you talk about how people can adapt fast, learn new skills, and be more likely to be successful in the future. But you mentioned there's some obstacles to creating a learning organization that managers might fall into. What are some of those that you talk about? I think definitely the first main obstacle is just the fact that people don't realize that they need to learn. You know, they actually start out with that mindset, and that can cause a huge problem right off the bat. Another thing is that I think a lot of managers create an organization that is not safe to learn, because learning is all about making mistakes. So it's kind of weird to say that, but I used to ski a lot. And we used to say that if you're not falling down, you're not learning. You've got to push yourself and you've got to, you know, you've always got to push yourself into something that's more difficult, something that maybe you didn't think you could achieve until you actually try it. So the best managers, I believe, make their team, their environment, their organization safe to learn. And being safe to learn means safe to fail. And of course, we want people to fail faster. You don't want, to, want them to fail catastrophically. You want to support them, but you want to give them the ability to make a mistake and not be punished for it. And you know that's often the biggest obstacle to learning is when people are afraid to make a mistake. They're afraid to look bad. They're afraid that their boss is going to land all over my bricks if they make a mistake. So yeah, the fear can be paralyzing in a way, you know, like if they're fearful that they're going to lose their job for making a mistake. Managers, I think, need to build an environment where it's okay to talk about those mistakes and learn from them because inevitably somebody else is going to make that same mistake. So why not share it with the team, right? Yeah. I know when I was working in business, you know, I've been a professional writer for the last 20 years working for myself, but I used to be a manager for a better part of 10 years. And I know that that was something we never considered doing. I mean, you would never call out mistakes in a meeting and then actually walk through how a person screwed up. Just that was, wasn't something we do. But I think today, and I know working with these product development people, these tech people that I work with, this is just part of the way they live. I mean, this is how they learn. Mistakes are made. They all talk about it. They all learn from it. It's very public. It's very transparent. It's not a bad thing to be called out for it because you're, everyone's going to learn from it. I found that one of the hardest things about management, especially being a new manager, is delegating appropriately. Knowing when to delegate certain things and when to do it yourself. You know, As managers, new managers make that transition from contributor to manager, they're often doing it themselves. And so it's easy to just fall back to that. Like, I'll just do it myself. I know how to do it. I don't want to teach or coach somebody on how to do it, or they can't do it as good as me. What do you want to say about delegation that new managers could really learn from? Well, definitely delegation is one of the main ways that managers get work done. I mean, the classic definition of management was to get work done through others. That's what management is, getting work done through others. So The way you get work done through others or with others, you want to use a collaborative word instead of a directive word, you know, with others, is to delegate work. And I think you're right. I mean, I know that when I was a manager, I'd often think, I'd make a decision. So let's say my boss wanted me to create a report and I would make a decision. I'd look at that report and I'd take a look at it and say, oh boy, it's going to take an employee, if I assign this to one of my employees, it's going to probably take them a couple of days to do the report. First of all, I have to figure out how to do it. Have to, and then I'll have to train them how to do it, which will take me time when I'm kind of busy with other stuff. Why don't I just do it myself? I'll do it way faster and it'll be done way better because that, that employee won't have any idea what to do. So that's a huge mistake. I mean, that's a recipe for failure for a manager, not delegating work. So I think that new managers and experienced managers as well, I mean, that's one of the number one tools you have to be a great manager is getting that work out to other people. It takes that workload off of you as a manager and it helps develop them as employees. They become better employees. They get to learn the skills that you have been keeping to yourself. They learn those skills and then they'll become potential managers as well someday if that's what they want to do. When delegating, is there an appropriate way to check in, monitor progress without feeling micromanager-like project management tools that you like or anything that would help kind of 
check in, but not invasively? Yeah, I, I think that the main way is to set up, a, and a lot of managers do this, they have a regular one-on-one meeting with their employees every week. So I mean, when I was a manager, the classic thing was to have a staff meeting every week. And I think that's a bad forum to do you know, check-ins for, for goals and tasks and delegating work. That's really not the appropriate venue. I think that the staff meeting should be a place where what's being talked about is relevant to everybody. But I think every manager should have a one-on-one with every one of their employees, their direct reports, uh, every week. And just make it a routine part of the, the week. This is a standing meeting. We're going to have a one-on-one. And we're going to go through everything that you've been assigned, all of your tasks. And let's talk about your progress. So it's not invasive. It's something that becomes just a routine part of doing business in your workplace. I feel like there's been an evolution with the way employees like to come to work. Some people like to do the nine to five thing, kind of punch the clock, go home. But I feel like a lot of people, maybe this is the millennial generation, but they really want to be connected to an overall purpose. And I think, you know, for a lot of organizations, they have mission, vision, and values set and they, you know, try to align their organizations. And I think managers are a great conduit between, you know, leadership at the highest level setting the vision and mission, and then the managers can connect it to the employees. How often should be they communicating mission and vision and in what ways could they be doing that? I think it should be a part of sort of almost like breathing. It should be a part of everything. And everything you do as a manager should somehow reflect the vision and mission of the company. So I think, and the way you communicate that is through every possible channel you have. You do it in your staff meetings. You do it in your one-on-ones. You hire for it. I think you know a lot of managers don't think about this, but when you've got a mission and vision, you should be hiring people that are aligned with that mission and vision. So right off the bat, you've got people that are already in alignment. That way you don't have to try to sell them on it. I think a lot of people, when they come into an organization, let's say you're a new manager in an organization and you want to bring your mission and vision in with you, you've got to sell the employees on that. But when you're hiring your own employees, you, you hire to that mission and vision and make sure that you hire people who are already aligned to it. Everybody nowadays has Slack, you know, these kinds of messaging platforms. You can promote it on that. Just so many different ways when you communicate that you should be promoting it, reminding everybody of your mission and vision, your company and customer stories and all those different kinds of ways that it comes out. I'm a huge fan of giving feedback, especially in the moment, timely. I think it's good for people to learn. But is there a certain point in which giving feedback might be too late and really not fair to the employee to share any longer, especially if it's constructive feedback? Yeah, so that's one of the, I think, the big mistakes many managers make is they don't provide, well, first of all, they don't provide any feedback or, or limited feedback, or they wait till an annual review or, or a semi-annual review or maybe even a quarterly review. That is so way too late. You've said, as you're perfectly right, is that you should give feedback immediately. I mean, when someone does something good, when they do something right, when they do something that you've asked them to do, give them the feedback right then and there, uh, whether it's good or bad, whether it's something, you know, it should always be constructive, but whether they did it right or wrong, you want to give them the feedback immediately and not wait. The longer you wait to give the feedback, the more stale it gets and the less relevant it is. And it really, it is kind of unfair to hit someone three months later and say, you know, I'm really mad you did this. And they go, what are you talking about? I I don't even remember what I did three months ago, you know, much less here you are confronting me about it now. So yeah, that's not fair. For any managers that might be uncomfortable doing this, do you have any tips for them to kind of put them at ease as far as giving constructive feedback in the moment? I think that it's a matter of realizing that this is a good thing not just for you as a manager, because you'll have an employee who's more, you know, knows better what's going on, not just for your organization, because your employees will be better able to do their jobs, but it's better for that employee too. It's, this is a positive for the employee. The last thing your employee needs is not knowing how they stand. And I think so many employees don't know where they stand relevant to their work. It's kind of a mystery. There was something we used to call it about mushrooms and shoveling stuff on the mushrooms and keeping them in the dark, you know, keeping employees in the dark. That seemed to be a common practice decades ago. But I think today, especially today, we're talking about being more transparent, letting people know what's going on, 
communicating more. I think for someone who is reticent to do that, I think just remember that that employee gains. It's really good for them to know where they stand and they want to know where they stand. And if they don't know where they stand, they're going to be nervous. They're going to be afraid. They're not going to perform as well as they will if they know where they stand. There's been lots of books written on motivating employees and what it takes to motivate people. And I think naturally, you know, employees think, oh, more money is going to solve the problem. But that's not necessarily true. And I think you write about that. Daniel Pink writes about that in his book, Drive. What other reward systems do you like to motivate employees that might be pretty unique that could work parallel with money? Well, money is certainly part of it, but I know there's been research done on this, and money is not the number one motivator. A friend of mine, a guy named Bob Nelson, yeah. who wrote a book, A Thousand and One Ways to Reward Employees, he did some research on this, and he found that the number one way to motivate employees, the number one response that they got back was just to give your employee a thank you, a simple thank you. And that could be in writing. I mean, you people use, you know, if you can write a little written thank you note. I've been in workplaces where someone's wall was covered with thank you notes that their boss wrote to them. They were so proud of that, just to have a thank you note that they could post on their wall. Um, or verbal. It could be a verbal thank you. It could be email, whatever it is. Just a thank you is not something to try to hold back on. It's something you should always be using. It's the easiest thing. It doesn't cost you any money at all. And it's extremely powerful according to the research. Part three of your book is really valuable for new managers because you pinpoint the most common challenges they make. And I think if people flipped open your book and read it, they would say, oh, okay, I can avoid these things. These are things that people make over and over again. Let's talk about a couple of them. I think you list like, let's say 10 or 12, but let's talk about employee problems first. For a new manager, employee problems would have to make them super uneasy. They, they've probably never been through it before, you know, corrective action, performance improvement, behavioral problems. What suggestions do you have for addressing whether it's performance or behavior issues? Again, it, this is all about feedback. So ultimately, addressing performance issues is providing feedback. And if you've set up an employee's goals in a quantitative way, so for example, we were talking about raising your sales by, say, 15% this upcoming quarter. You need to provide that feedback. So at the end of the quarter, you need to actually meet with that employee and provide the feedback. And then you get the data. You say, okay, we've got the data. Here's the report. It says that your sales only increase, say, 5%. So you need to provide the feedback. You need to meet with the employee, provide the feedback during the meeting. And then you need to work with them closely to figure out what you can do to improve the performance. What's getting in the way? You got to get to the root of what's getting in the way. Is it something they need? Do they need more training? Do they need more support from you? Is there some training tool or sales tool they, that would help them that they don't have? Or conversely, if they've exceeded the goal. So let's say that goal was 15%, they did 25%. Boy, that's a great time to celebrate. So you know, during that performance meeting, you're going to be telling them, wow, well, great job. And maybe even enlist them to help other salespeople, like the ones who aren't performing as well. How about doing a, a workshop our sales team and telling them what you did to achieve that great goal. So it's all about, again, providing feedback, quantified and data-driven. Office politics is another one you talk about. I think managers can get caught in it. You mentioned gossiping. That's a huge problem. There's a lot that you list, but it's gossiping is a huge problem. And if I think managers catch wind of it, hopefully they don't participate in it. But what could they do about gossiping as an example? Yeah, I mean, gossiping... It's just a natural thing that people tend to do. And obviously, some people are bigger gossipers than others are. But again, there's research on gossiping, and gossip is one of the top things people do at work. And men and women both are engaged in it. So when it becomes negative, I think you have to decide, is this becoming a negative influence in our office? I mean, any amount of gossip is going to be a natural thing. And if, as long as it's not destructive... But when it becomes destructive to an organization, a manager has to act on it and deal with the employees. So for example, let's say someone's gossiping and spreading rumors that are not true about maybe your organization is going to cut back on staff. I mean, this is a common kind of thing where gossip might go around that, oh, they're going to lay off a bunch of people next week. If that's not true, or even if it's true, 
you don't want people spreading gossip like that. So you need to figure out who those people are and bring them in, talk to them one-on-one, talk to them very candidly, very directly, and explain to them that this is not a positive thing in, in our office and, and you need to stop doing that because it's not helping anyone. Just getting people distracted, it's they're becoming disengaged in their work and they're, they're becoming less productive. So you have to deal with those people one-on-one. A certain amount of gossip I don't think is a big deal as long as it's not destructive to the organization. Well, Peter, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, your book is jam-packed with ideas for new managers and I think it's really valuable for anybody that's now leading people or even for managers who just need to learn and grow. I think this is a great book for them too. Where can people learn more about the book, anything about what you're doing, and be happy to have you share some of that stuff? Yeah, my website, petereconomy.com, is a place to go. It pretty much has all the books I've worked on. And then on the main page of the website, you'll see a link to this book I've just done, you know, Wait, I'm the Boss. And there's a link to actually look at a preview of the book, or you can buy the book through Amazon there as well. Peter, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good to have you. Thanks, Brandon. I had a blast.